Instead of, uh, I know how early it is in the morning, so I have a quiz for you. It's a true-false quiz on Kate Capshaw. Um, this is the sign language for an F. If I do an F for me, this is false. There you go. And this is true. So you got a T with your thumb between these two fingers. Okay, so give me a T if it's true. Give me an F if it's false. According to Kate, she grew up with parents who were lefties. True or false? If you don't know, you can just guess. It's okay. <laughs> that is true. Many stories there. <laughs> Kate has an adopted African-American brother and four children adopted from Haiti. Ooh, okay, part of it's true. Her, she does have a brother who is African-American and a sister who is African-American. Um, and she has two children adopted from Haiti, uh, Joe, 14, and Liam, 11. And then she also has Grace, 13, and Nola, 8. Ooh, I can't believe she brought her as a baby to CHLA, and she's 8. How can that be? OK, next one. Kate graduated summa cum laude in 1990 from Manhattan College with a BA in biology. <laughs> False. English. <laughs> All right. I know, really. Yes. Francelia Butler was Kate's dissertation advisor and mentor at UConn. False. Margaret Higginay. Kate published an article on childhood, the body, and race performance in African American Review in 2006. Oh, they're scared now. It's okay. It's all right. Y'all can be wrong. True. That is true. She also published in the journal Canadian Children's Literature. True. She's all over the place. Kate has an article published in Appalachian Heritage Journal. True. Very true. <laughs> Bessie Woodson Yancey, African American poet and social critic, summer 2008. Kate taught at Florida International University and Rhode Island College before becoming faculty at UConn. True. Good job. Um, true, she taught at Florida International University from 2000 to 2003, at Rhode Island College from 2003 to 2004, and she joined the faculty at UConn in 2004. Kate has published research on Langston Hughes and Arna Bonton, whom she considers the fathers of African American children's literature, Bonton more than Hughes, because he did a lot of the heavy lifting, and dedicated an entire chapter to their work in children's literature of the Harlem Renaissance. True. And Children's Literature of the Harlem Renaissance also won the Book Award for CHLA that year. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, all told, Kate has been involved in editing of the Children's Literature Association Quarterly for roughly 14 years. Can you believe that is true? Oh my gosh. Yes, starting out as the Cultural Pluralism co-editor, then associate editor under Richard Flynn, now five years as editor, and now she gets her life back soon because Claudia uh, Nelson has taken the helm. <laughs> she has a piece in Lynn Vallone and Julia Mickenberg's edited anthology, Oxford Handbook of Children's Literature, 2009. <laughs> Richard says, yes, believe Richard. Yes, The Dream Keeper is that piece. Kate wrote the chapter on African-American children's literature in Phil Nell and Lisa Paul's keywords for children's literature. Y'all better find Phil, y'all better find. False, I wrote that one. She wrote the <laughs> <laughs> That was a trick question. I wrote, the, I wrote the, that one and she wrote the, wrote the one on race. Her favorite food is barbecue. Sushi. Kate helped me write the first draft of the call for papers for this conference on a train in China. Good, y'all are getting better. All right, Kate's newest book entitled Civil Rights Childhood, Photo Books and Liberation will be out in November. Yay, true. Okay, and of this work, Gerald Early of Washington University in St. Louis writes, Catherine Capshaw's new study, Intersecting Photography, Children's Literature, and the Civil Rights Movement, is a rich and strikingly original addition to the growing scholarship on African American childhood. Many scholars will appreciate and be indebted to this important work. Last one, Kate sings in a women's singing circle and beats drums. True, welcome Kate Capshaw. I, 
I think we can just go now because that was wonderful. <laughs> that was so great, Michelle. Thank you. I'm so touched. And thank you, Sarah Schwebel, also. I mean, this has been, I know we, we all feel this way. This has been a really amazing gathering of ideas and a nice site of exchange. And we're just, I know lots of us in the organization have been waiting for years and years for a conference like this one. And um, I just want to thank Sarah and Michelle very, very much. Thank you. Now you've had laughs. I'm afraid I don't have much humor in my talk today, so that's okay, I guess. I'm going to begin with um, an image from Amiri Baraka's photographic book, In Our Terribleness, um, to signal the idea of the child in movement. I want to begin with a question of movement. This is a book he published um, with a multiply constituted audience of children and adults. Um, I'd like to think more generally, though, about movement, as in, what are the forces that have moved our field towards a discussion of diversity? What is the role of civil rights movements in shaping our field? And what are the directions that our field may take in consideration of the past and the pressures of the moment? So movement is on my mind, where we have been and where we are going. Our position today, where we are as a field, is fundamentally vexed. 50 years after the Civil Rights Act, in the wake of the revolutionary student movements of the 1970s and 1960s, and the tremendous activism of groups like the Council on Interracial Books for Children and others, we are here. <clears throat> An image you've seen through social media and other outlets, doubtless. We are in a place where books by ethnic authors are not being published and sold at the rates proportional to the population of children of color. This is Lee and Lowe's. Um, graphic that Jason Lowe offered at the publisher's panel. But with the efforts of the Cooperative Children's Book Center, Teaching for Change, American Indians and Children's Literature, the We Need Diverse Books campaign, the Color My Shelf hashtag on Twitter, and so on, the need for diverse children's literature has taken center stage, and it's about time. I have to see Michelle Martin as a visionary because she's been planning this conference for two years and all of these energies have coalesced at this moment. It's really quite, you are a visionary, this is great. Um, and I realize that you know the, the statistics in this image and that many of you have spent your professional lives advocating for a more inclusive, more expansive children's literature. There are many forces at play in the marginalization of books by people of color about ethnic experience, the foremost being publishing as a field. And I know many of us were very grateful to have the publishing panel two days ago. What I want to add to the conversation is a call for our scholarship for our work as teachers and within institutions to grow. We are in a place where, especially in terms of race in the United States, our scholarship is bereft where there is only one major critical article on Walter Dean Meyer's monster, a smattering of work on Virginia Hamilton, and relatively little on the great bodies of Asian American and Latino Latina children's literature, despite all of the awards and accolades these texts have received. <coughs> Excuse me. Child readers suffer from a lack of books, and we suffer from a lack of scholarship, scholarship that can filter down into our classrooms to feed our students and the ideas to feed their students. We also suffer from historical tendencies in our criticism, which I'll discuss a bit later. I'd like to think about why, in US scholarship, attention to race and children's literature has been a difficult prospect. What I thought I would do with this presentation would be to consider how we arrived here, what scholarship and ethnic studies can tell us about the institutional structures that have contributed to our limitations in terms of work on race. Also, I have to acknowledge, of course, that I cannot cover all of the subjects that fall under the umbrella of diversity at this conference, gender, sexuality, disability, religion, class, as well as aesthetic configurations and innovations. In terms of this talk, I offer you a roadmap See if it'll show up. Okay, I'm going to begin with the civil rights movement, then shift into the emergence of multiculturalism as a site of difficulty, <clears throat> then move to the question of children's literature and its limitations, and conclude by focusing on the politics of institutionalization and the possibilities for children's literature. So in other words, I want to look at the question of race in US children's literature scholarship from an ethnic studies perspective, and then look back at ethnic studies um, and the academy through children's literature. So from the outset, I want to make clear that I'm working from a particularly US context and from experience in African American and ethnic studies. 
While my focus here is in the United States, I hope to launch a conversation with colleagues who are experts on representations of race and racism as an interdependent dynamic in Canada, Australia, the UK, West Africa, and the Car Caribbean. I also want to invite critics who may bring disciplinary expertise, perhaps in the role of history or art history, to the analysis of visual codes, and in education to the history of that discipline. Now I will step back and reveal who I am as a critic. This is a very, uh, I don't know, kind of exposing moment here. I, I am invested in the role of the US Academy to ethnic literature because I seek a more materialist, interventionist critical practice, one that links the ideas we study to the lived experience of young people in the United States. So to return to the second slide, I begin by wondering how far we have not come since the 1970s. Enter the civil rights movement with its legislative victories of the 1950s, Brown versus the Board of Education, the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act of 65, as well as the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act, um, which propelled publishers into issuing books for schools that served low-income children. Enter the interventions of progressives like Eleanor Sinet, Harlem librarian who worked for the Council of, on Interracial Books for Children, as well as people like Arnold Adolph, John Steptoe, Tom Feelings, and so many others. As Walter Dean Myers famously said of this moment, the late 60s and early 70s, we thought we were changing the world. And in many ways, they did. <clears throat> This surge in children's book productivity dovetails with what Jacqueline Dowd Hall calls the long civil rights movement. We can see that the progressive energies in children's literature are not truncated by the civil rights classical period of 1954 to 1965, but rather extend forward through the 1970s, bearing multiple iterations and targets, as well as ideological positions. <clears throat> I have some slides from some photographic books of this moment. This is from June Jordan's Dry Victories, a book that should be reissued because it is one of the most powerful children's texts I've ever encountered. Um, this is an image from a photographic picture book by John Shearer, who wrote as well as took the photographs as a protege of Gordon Parks, and um, it's a very confrontational and engaging text. And this is an image by Poems from Cali, which is a child poet in the black arts movement who is writing um, in order to kind of galvanize the community around reinvention, cultural reinvention. Witness also, see if I can get this worked, the avalanche of black children's writers at that moment, spurred by the energies of the culture as well as by investments of publishers. This is evidence of what Richard Flynn reminds us about Gwendolyn Brooks's poetry for children, that it, quote, explores even more fully the view shared by black scholars that no single definition of childhood could accurately describe the lives of black children. We find multiplicity, variety, tension in this moment. This is a special moment for black children's literature in the early 1970s. So what happened to the energy of the movement? What happened in culture is clear. Hall explains that, quote, after a season of moral clarity, the country is beset by the Vietnam War, urban riots, reaction against the excesses of the late 60s and early 70s. A so-called white backlash sets the stage for the conservative interregnum that, for good or for ill, marks the beginning of another story, the story that surrounds us now, unquote. Beginning in the mid-80s in the US, standards and testing educational push severely truncated uses of literature in the elementary classroom, and educators in our audience can certainly speak much more to this issue than I, um, and the attacks on ethnic curricula and the resistance to bi ed bilingual education happening in the 80s um, also helped shut down ethnic children's literature. Theorists in ethnic studies can help us understand what happened next for us in the academy. For Roderick Ferguson, and his text is called The Reorder of Things, The University and Its Pedagogy of Minority Difference. The university became the site of quote unquote minority reconciliation, a place of trade-offs, material change traded in for incorporation and inclusion. Diversity in the academy stood in for material revolution. The establishment of ethnic studies programs within institutions brought compromises, as many scholars have pursued. And importantly for us, it launched a renewed effort to codify and regulate the representations of ethnic experience. Ethnic studies programs led to the canon wars of the 80s and 90s. This was a moment of the university's insistence on its own representationality and plurality. 
Uh, let's look at this trend's traits with an eye towards understanding the way we still might be conceiving of study of ethnic children's literature, those critical traces that might still limit our ways of engaging text. Ethnic scholars, um, ethnic study scholars characterize this moment through three main elements. First, the idea of literature as access to actual information about minority groups intensified during this period with the identity of the author becoming a part of that which was accessed through reading. Second, Books during official multiculturalism had to make race a central element, hopefully with an emphasis on the American dream and the successful incorporation into that dream. Lovely. Finally, a work by a person of color entered a commodified institutional system whereby its value was located in its usefulness for training students into citizens. Anti-racism becomes equated with a desire to consume books and knowledge about culture gets slotted into spaces on the syllabus. Aesthetic readings of books, Trump political or material readings during this period. We get intensified interest in the triumphalism of voice, divested often of political implications. And with the commodification of ethnic texts, we find a deepened interest in what is authentic about writing, a turn again to the sociological with the expectation of usefulness for the white reader within an institution. I read Maya Angelou and I know black culture, that kind of commodification. <laughs> and representationality um, offering the typical story framed within the limited narrative of a syllabus. As Phil Serrato reminds us of Latino Latina children's literature, quote, such a perspective effectively reduces or restricts the utility or worth of these texts to token encounters with diversity, which is to say otherness. Ultimately, as multicultural literature, Latino Latina children's literature becomes or remains for many consumers a potentially intimidating or estranged other kind of literature, which is to say literature by, for, and about others. Okay, so let's look for a moment at the rise of civil rights narratives for young people in the mid-1990s as part of this trend of official multiculturalism. Civil rights stories, in fact, exploded in the mid-1990s. There was quite a dearth of attention to the civil rights movement until the mid-1990s, and they've been a mainstay of children's publishing ever since. So what happens to civil rights narratives under these pressures? First, we need to understand why ethnic scholars see the institutionalization of ethnic literature as a kind of trade-off. As ethnic literature was moving into the universities and gaining a kind of legibility in the 80s and 90s, poor people and people of color suffered greatly from the withdrawal of actual civil rights supports. Just as public structural foundations for urban citizens were crumbling in the 80s and 90s, politicians bemoaned the state of the cities and popular culture depicted people of color through images of urban decay and destruction. The state of the cities became the proving ground for definitions of American identity. <clears throat> Politicians and the media characterized immigrants as essentially foreign, affirmative action as the cause of the economic decline of the white middle class, and black people in cities as welfare queens living off the system, evidence of their failure to adhere to the ideals of American individualism. Antagonism towards the poor extended into the 1990s with the Clinton um, presidency's emphasis on welfare reform, for instance. And the 1992 Los Angeles riots appeared to some to be evidence of black people's refusal to access American values. Burning their own neighborhoods and destroying businesses, black people were publicly stigmatized as violent, socially alien, and fundamentally ungrateful for the freedoms the US supposedly extended. The pervasiveness of the term underclass during this period um, in the 90s indicated the displacement of the blame for poverty onto poor people rather than acknowledging the political abandonment of the inner cities. Civil rights photo books emerged during this moment, a profound despair and contention about the reasons for the material and social collapse of the urban community. The popularity of civil rights texts for children speaks on some registers of the desire for an uplifting narrative of social progress, a happy ending introduced within school contexts that reinforces the viability of American ideals. The popularity also speaks to, of a cultural desire to redefine and restructure characterizations of black Americans to tell the truth about America and black communities. 
These goals have been and remain accessible to writers and readers of various ideological stripes. For neoconservatives in the 1990s, the turn to civil rights narratives might serve the overall temperament of conservative discourse in the face of ideas about national decline. Civil rights books might serve for some as evidence of all that has been done for black people, with federal officials and images representing the role of the state in enforcing the accessibility of American ideals. And there are many books that figure the state as the hero in the civil rights narrative. In the face of simplistic versions of a racial nightmare in the early 1990s, civil rights books might permit, for some, a kind of denial of the real economic and social difficulties faced by children. They might represent civil rights as a solved problem a told story, easily accessed, compartmentalized, institutionalized, and dismissed. Black authors in the mid-90s and beyond resisted a teleology that blamed the poor for a decline precipitated in large part by neoconservative policy. Black writers, then, can be understood as gravitating to civil rights stories as a means of articulating, conspicuously, the truth of black identity and black cultural life. The turn to images of clean-cut, earnest, courageous children walking determinedly into schools might respond to the pervasive media representations of black youth as gangbangers, and sexually and morally corrupt. Or for some, civil rights narratives might assert a core black American identity, countering ideas that the urban underclass has turned away from individualism, integrity, and morality. Civil rights photo books for young people drew on the energies of official multiculturalism, becoming one of the most acceptable stories to tell about black identity, offered within institutional settings like school to an audience being trained in citizenship. In this way, the text which already told the right story of minorities not as an underclass, of the extension slash embrace of democratic ideals to or by black people, of the guaranteed success of the American integration story, become positioned even more steadfastly as the truth of black culture easily consumed for a young readership. The movement remains the right story to tell, offering a malleable set of images that can be used variously in response to ideas about urban decline, the vitality of democracy, the success of the American project, and culture as commodity. One might also think about the ways in which Latino, Latina, Jewish American, and Asian American texts during this moment have gravitated to the topics of immigration and holidays, particularly in the 1990s, sites that also might serve official multiculturalism in similar ways. Although much time has passed since the 90s, we continue to grapple with issues of representationality, authenticity, and incorporation in our own work. Regulation of ethnic texts and the emphasis on authenticity and voice are all particular and aggravated concerns for those of us working in children's literature. And this is because we are implicated not only in the institution of the university with its diversity requirements, however they are framed, incorporated, and compartmentalized, but also because many of us are involved in the training of teachers. The right story of an ethnic culture is something that we all still struggle with when constructing our syllabi full well knowing that our pedagogy extends into the way the elementary and secondary classrooms work to produce citizens. In our own work in teaching, we need to watch out for how we pose the supposed truth of any ethnic community story through books. <clears throat> in many ways, for good or for ill, expectations inherited from official multiculturalism still structure our own critical engagement with children's texts and we must become aware, more aware, of the risks and compromises of an approach that is inflected by sociology, instrumentality, and commodification. These approaches steer scholarship, our scholarship in the U.S., through particular well-trod pathways, studies of voice, celebratory readings, quests for authenticity, and I'll say more about that in a moment, and prevent critical approaches to ethnic texts that are more wide-ranging, more interdisciplinary, more historical, psychoanalytic, materialist, and theoretical. We might use cognitive science to explore ethnic texts. We might use theories of space. We might use post-humanism. There are so many different frames we could apply to ethnic texts, but we, we don't do this. Our scholarship in non-ethnic US children's literature is rich. Just witness the, the flourishing of queer theory on queer children's literature. We need to use these new frames to examine ethnic texts. 
I'm speaking specifically to young scholars. I'm going to point now. Young scholars, get out there. <laughs> because you are the ones at the forefront of scholarship. You are the ones doing the research for your institutions, whether it's pre-tenure or, or for a dissertation. You are invested in exciting theoretical positions. And I urge you with all my heart and soul to apply those ideas to ethnic texts. <sighs> OK. <laughs> All right. I've been referring to the term multiculturalism within ethnic studies, and I should pause and explain that in many senses, children's literature and ethnic studies do not even speak the same language. We operate in silos. Case in point, multiculturalism. In children's literature, the term has an edge, an impassioned political edge that argues not only for re-examinations of the shape of children's literature, its lineages, generic possibilities, and multiplicity of investments, but it often has a pragmatic political edge as well, since many of us work to put books into children's hands. A good thing, multiculturalism in our world. Educators call it critical multiculturalism, to use Stephen Mays and Christine Sleater's term. For ethnic studies, in the US and universities, the term multiculturalism suggests an approach to literature that has to do with management and containment. Um, Vijay Prashad, whose wonderful book, it has a great title too, Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting, <laughs> Afro-Asian Connections and the Myth of Cultural Purity. He argues, quote, multiculturalism emerged as the liberal doctrine to undercut the radicalism of anti-racism. It's true. Instead of anti-racism, we are now fed with a diet of cultural pluralism and ethnic diversity. The history of oppression, the fact of exploitation, are shunted aside in favor of a celebration of difference and the experience of individuals who can narrate their ethnicity for the consumption of others." Unquote. Or Angela Davis, who, who suggests that multiculturalism, quote, can easily become a way to guarantee that those differences and diversities within ethnic communities are retained superficially while becoming homogenized and harmonized politically, especially along the axes of class, gender, and sexuality. Unquote. In short, multiculturalism within ethnic studies invokes what theorists see a shift away from anti-racism and power and towards versions of diversity that are largely celebratory at best and incorporative at worst. I bring up the different uses of the term multicultural in order for us together to consider the particular risks of working on diversity issues in children's literature within the structure of the academy. So now we've moved through parts one and two of the talk, civil rights and the emergence of multiculturalism onto children's literature vulnerabilities through an ethnic studies critique. You didn't know we would be talking about vulnerabilities <laughs> this hour. <laughs> okay, here are some questions I have about our particular vulnerabilities. First, the institutionalization of children's literature. Every field working within a university system has its own set of subjects, methodologies and, methodologies and core theories. Canon formation articulates a discipline. Children's literature is particularly subject to the pressures of institutions that bear on its sites of inquiry. Take English for an example. We are the, one of the only fields in the US um, to articulate not only the general socializing imperatives of the university or college as an institution, <clears throat> but also more particularly to intersect with pressures from education, both within the university and as articulated expressly by the state. Librarianship as a discipline also helps shape our sites of inquiry, and the publishing and prizing systems help dictate the things we talk about and what we deem canonical. Alternately, use education and consider the pressures from English librarianship and the state on how that um, discipline is articulated. We need to historicize the canon. Um, Karen Westman gave an absolutely brilliant talk yesterday where she um, described the way in which we can incorporate, try and incorporate children's literature in and of itself into survey classes. Um, and she says, I'm going to mangle the quote because I was writing quickly, deracinated from history, texts aren't legible within departments. We're even siloed within our own departments, right, as being an ahistorical kind of supposedly field, and we seek legibility through historicization. We need critical reading practices, as Sarah Schwebel outlines them in her book, Child-Sized History, an understanding of our own work about why some texts gain canonicity. Thoughtful interrogation of the canon involves understanding the historical situatedness of every text, and Schwebel models this beautifully. Our institutional positioning is intensified by these intersecting fields. <clears throat> Nancy Tolson reminds us that we need diverse voices in librarianship just as much as in publishing and in education. I'd also like us to think then about how we are complicit in managing difference. That's a, that's a term that ethnic theorists use in regulating what our students and their students see about the world of children's texts. 
<clears throat> a second risk particular to children's literature is the fetishizing of authenticity. And again, I think at times the way we employ the term authenticity differs profoundly from some in ethnic studies at large. We have dedicated scholars like Donnery McCann and Debbie Rees who undertake questions of authenticity as distinctly anti-racist projects. We have an opening in our field for that kind of inquiry because it explores questions of what gets taught and introduced to young people, what are the particular contours of literary history, because for the most part they're looking um, at texts authored by white people, um, and what are the particular contours of our literary history. Oh, I said that already. This is valuable um, interventionist political work. However, when scholars in ethnic studies use the term authenticity, they bring up issues that also have particular weight for us as the institutional mediators for children's literature. These critics fear that in introducing a perspective on ethnicity fueled solely by authenticity, that the version of culture offered tips toward the ahistorical, embracing ideas of pure histories untouched by modernity and globalization, or of identities that are singular in lineage, some alternatives from ethnic studies on the idea of culture. Culture is not a thing. Culture is a negotiation. Um, Prashad encourages a perspective that claims multiplicity. Quote, the best intentions of respect and tolerance can often be annoying to those whose cultures are not in dominance. We feel that we are often zoological specimens, kind of being scrutinized for authenticity. Um, to respect the fetish of culture assumes that one wants to enshrine it in the museum of humankind rather than find within it the potential for liberation or for change, unquote. He encourages a polycultural critical lens considering the way histories interact to shape a lived cultural experience. Such attention moves away from looking for the true cultural threads and towards the multiple, dynamic, contradictory, and ambivalent. We might, even turn, we might turn even more forcefully toward intersectionality in our criticism, examining the relationship of class, gender, religion, race, ethnicity, disability, nationality and region and shaping representation like millions of music albums that are sold in just that way unquote that Myers rep that Myers mentions the lack of an anti-racist target here is profoundly brilliant um, it's a truly brilliant insight one to speak one that speaks to our particular position in a culture made anxious by any mention of race we can't be afraid to name racism as racism when we see it Appeals to co the colorblind distract from the material in inequalities that persist in our field. They may also feed tendencies in our own work, scholarship and teaching, that sideline or ignore texts which const construct childhood as difficult, complicated, or unsatisfying. We've all been thinking about why ethnic children's texts aren't taught widely enough in survey courses, or I hope we have. Um, is it because they spring from cultures and historical moments that do not settle neatly into narratives of a syllabus? one that might begin with the romantic child? Do, they, do syllabi construct some texts as universal, the golden age, and others targeted to particular raced audiences? As a result, do more supposedly universal texts appear on a syllabus? And so I wonder whether our syllabi participate in a kind of colorblind logic. <clears throat> as we are more aware of the structural impediments to publishing ethnic books for children, we can also consider the impediments within our own departments and in institutions that hinder intellectual work with books by ethnic authors or about children of color. What are the demands on that survey course? What are we telling our students, our te student teachers, about what matters in children's literature? Should we balance? I, I originally want wrote down, how do we balance a duty to the canon? Should we balance a duty to the canon with the need to reflect the variety of approaches in our, to childhood in our literatures? Or should we reconsider radically the idea of the canon? Even invoking race in US culture can lead to accusations of extremism and purposeful discord. We cannot be afraid to speak about the racialized structures that influence the way we teach and what we study. <clears throat> The last limitation in our field that we might examine is generic. I submit that there are tendencies within children's literature, within some children's texts, that may undermine complicated representations of minoritized experience and stories. The first and probably most powerful is children's books <clears throat> tendencies, excuse me, <clears throat> to rely on heroic individualism. But again, I'll turn to contemporary representations of the civil rights movement, since that's what I've been working with lately. But one could think about individualism within fiction about race and ethnicity. Consensus about the civil rights era 
might be most clearly expressed in classrooms across America, spaces which frequently articulate the struggle through images beloved by adults. Students learn about the evils of segregation, the triumphs of boycotts, the grand leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. His birthday may be a national holiday, but nowhere is it celebrated with more regularity than in children's classrooms. Childhood becomes the site on which the consensus memory of the civil rights movement is formed. Its salient features. King, of course, is the most prominent personality, with Rosa Parks as his female analog. I almost said sidekick, but that sounded, that sounded wrong. <laughs> but King is imagined largely through images of his I have a dream speech and assassination, rather than, say, through his resistance to the Vietnam War or through his Poor People's Campaign. In other words, representations truncate King. He is knowable only through early integration protest and his martyrdom. One element frequently cited in this nationally palatable story of King and civil rights is the popular interpretation of his 1963 Abbott Dream speech, the climax of which is often edited to invoke childhood futurity rather than contemporary political situatedness. There are no foaming um, Alabama racists in most children's books that cite this speech, although he, you know, the speech is, you have to read the whole thing, it's amazing. Further, relying on King to emblematize the movement brings certain compromises. The singularity of King as leader erases the hard work of countless individuals who sacrificed profoundly and acted courageously for the cause of equality. It minimizes the importance of networks of people facilitating social action. For children, however, the valorization of King maps nicely onto the narratives in which they are immersed. A singular individual battles the evil of racism, solving the problem of oppression, changing the landscape for a community he loves. Sounds like a fairy tale. I realize I am not pursuing children's fiction in my own work, but I ask us to consider the inadequacies in representing culture that may result from individualistic stories that place oppression and its solutions in the personal rather than in racist structures and response to them. I also <clears throat> ask us to think about the implications of individualism within our own scholarship. <clears throat> Another generic trope within children's texts that shapes representation is a tendency to see amity as a solution to social problems. Again, civil rights texts are a good way into this question. There's a long tradition of imagining racial progress through amity in children's literature, through friendship across races that can transform psychologically. This strategy was certainly alive during the post-World War II impulse to affirm universal democratic principles, but it persists in children's literature. <coughs> So for example, in uh, Toni Morrison's Remember the Journey to School Integration stages interracial friendship as the cause and the reward of civil rights um, action. In focusing on affect, a book can elide the complexities of children's actual political investment in civil rights activities in favor of a re representation of childhood, black and white, as essentially innocent, welcoming, and somewhat naive. This book's emphasis on friendship erases the particularities of history within the text. It has a preface that specifies things, uh, but the text itself erases history and the agency of individual civil rights workers, leaping over the real challenges of the struggle, as well as any discussion of hard-won political rights. It concludes by alluding to Martin Luther King as the magic man who makes everything right. Um, contrast that with Carol Weatherford's powerful book, um, Birmingham, 1963. This is an, an amazing text, um, a, a really profoundly moving text that does not close off the need for continued social action. Um, the problem with Amity, for me anyway, is that it, it frames everyone as equal citizens, equal citizens and deflects the examination of material injustice. Um, power dynamics between groups get sidelined. I don't want to spend too much time discussing the limitations of a Nobel Prize winner's book, but uh, <laughs> I bring it up so that we can consider the way in which children's texts can tilt towards the apolitical by staging justice work through personal friendship rather than through structural or social interventions. We might think about how this limitation would play out within a fictional text. How might a book that represents cultural experience rely on interracial friendship as the solution to racism? There are other, probably other generic issues we could discuss that might make children's literature a particularly complicated place to talk about issues of race and diversity, and I'd love to start a dialogue about um, that subject. But I'd like to turn in this last section of the talk to the possibilities that children's literature has as a field. I spent my time here talking about what ethnic studies has to offer us in terms of self-examination. So let's think now about what we have to offer that is particularly productive for the academy. Advantage one. 
our advantages. Advantage one, we can see. <laughs> the first advantage is that we have derives from the fact that we are framed by multiple institutions. And I know I said earlier this position puts pressures on us, certainly it does, but it also renders us especially aware of the machinations of institutions, particularly self-critical in ways that other fields may not be. <clears throat> we are aware of our situatedness and the connection of our work to actual people <coughs> in, excuse me, outside of the academy. I would also posit that we are a liminal group and that in our liminality we can find the ability to be legible within institutions <clears throat> but able to reflect on their shape and investments. To follow Roderick Ferguson, quote, we have an opportunity to construct a materialist analysis that engages the academy and its duplicitous valorization of minority difference in culture, unquote. How can we do that? Each of us sits at the juncture between institutional forces gender and sexuality studies, class studies, library science, literacy and curriculum, teacher training, English, history, art, the archive, cultural studies, outreach, and we all have a kind of perspective on the expectations and workings of institutions. This is Gay YA, the ultimate gay reading list, gotta go there. Um, this is the Association of Jewish Libraries, <clears throat> it's a wonderful resource. Zeta Elliott's blog, fantastic. I'm going so quickly, I'm sorry. Wait, <laughs> slowly, slowly. Zeta Elliott, I can give you all of these, you just corner me, I'll give you, I, and, and apparently I'm being recorded. <laughs> um, Latinos and Children's Lit. <clears throat> Debbie Reese's really, really quite substantive um, American Indians in Children's Literature. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas's The Dark Fantastic, which is a, a new initiative that she's been um, really quite energetic about. Brilliant. Oops, wait, we'll end there for a minute. And the humanities at large, along with child readers in libraries, homes, and in classrooms, need our public advocacy more than ever. Min Song, who's an ethnic studies theorist, asked about the hostility toward the humanities in this current moment. How might the political situation now undergirding such debates, fueled by a rage for libertarian policies that will not only defund the humanities, but a whole array of, of governmental programs that are meant to serve a broad civic purpose, be connected to the rising awareness of how the children who so strongly represent the future in this country are increasingly no longer majority white. Is the attack on the humanities connected to the growth of a non-white child population? perhaps in part, and certainly we might think about the implications of colorblind legislation. So our final advantage in terms of uh, resituating diversity within children's literature and the academy. Advantage three, we can dream. In starting this section, I want to pause for a moment and return to the 1992 Los Angeles riots, a profound moment of cultural despair for communities of color and the nation at large. In a documentary film about those riots titled The Fire This Time, Community organizer Lillian Mobley says of African-American boys, quote, no one is prepared for them to live, but they are prepared for them to die, unquote. And in many ways, U.S. culture refuses life to children of color, either by not granting them representation or hiding behind laws like the Stand Your Ground Law, or by pretending that the supposedly colorblind society offers all children equal educational and social opportunities. The United States is not prepared for children of color to live. We can offer through scholarship and teaching, and what our artists offer is representation as a form of intervention. Ethnic children's literature is not sociological, <clears throat> and it shouldn't be treated that way. It offers room to dream and conceive otherwise. This is what our best black fantasy writers like Nettie Okorafor and Zeta Elliott offer us. This is what realist writers offer, like Eric Gansworth on the Tuscarora Indians, and if I ever get out of here, our writers can dream. Our writers have vision. And by teaching, talking, and writing, writing academically, writing politically, writing publicly, we can help support a vision of the future that is expansive and inclusive, one that points to our artists' maps, the maps that Christopher Myers suggests in his new academy. We should not, as scholars. I urgently hope that publishers will respond, and we see independent presses like Lee and Lowe and Just Us Books leading the way. And Zeta Elliott reminds us that self-publishing is another pathway towards these various articulations. As scholars, we need to be courageous enough to intervene where we can, how we read, what we discuss, how we institutionalize children's literature, what we introduce to our students. 
I know a lot of you in the room, and I know you have the courage to be funky, to use a 70s word. Um, <laughs> we are all working to revitalize our scholarship teaching and the representative of their particular, um, you know, identities. And the humanities, yeah. I mean, it's 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 um, a topic that I know ethnic studies scholars are discussing. I know that that they're trying to make this more legible. But those of us who are not um, people of color can bring these conversations to the service because sometimes people, um, professors of color, are untenured, and so they can't say no, or they feel like they can't say no. And, they, and or or many, I'd say, you know. Lots of people feel a, a kind of ethical obligation to serve. I can't speak for, for scholars of color within the academy, but I've read um, statements about it, kind of an ethical obligation to you know, serve students of color, which places other kinds of pressures. But that's a, that's a really fundamental question about um, you know, the place of ethnic studies within the academy. So I thank you for that. Any other comments on that issue from anybody? I also think, this is a, just a sidebar, I think children's literature scholars also get kind of um, created as the caretakers of the department and for many of us. Um, we teach classes that fill as opposed to others, no offense Spencer, um, <laughs> but we have the advisees, we, we do a lot of the heavy lifting. We, we're seen as maternal, yeah. Yeah, that's true too, yeah, yeah. We're also, that's right, we're also peripheral, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Phil, you had your hand up? Oh, you went like this? All right. Any other questions? But thank you all. Thank you very much for coming.